up, everyone? <laughs> Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 380. Uh, officially out, out, out there. Uh, we're <laughs> officially out there. Up there. <laughs> um, exciting show tonight. We get to bring on our dear friend, Yassine Daboon, to chat a bit about Quad Dipsy, uh, the race that he just completed this last weekend, placing top 10, I believe, uh, in a pretty stacked race. I'm going to find out more about that. Uh, with you seen tonight, but also his new project, Move Through Darkness, which we actually just found out. We had him on the show exactly <laughs> one year ago, November 30th, 2020, to chat about this project last year. So I can't wait to hear more about it, how he's maybe approaching it differently this year, uh, who it benefits, the reason behind the project. It's a it's a beautiful thing. And we're going to talk to Yassine Daboon all about that tonight. Welcome, everyone, to Ginger Runner Live. The show begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! What is up, everyone? <laughs> Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 380. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Tuesdays to spend a little bit of it with us. Exciting show tonight. I'm very excited about it. Mm -hmm. uh, our guest tonight, Yassine Daboon, is joining us. Uh, it's been, I believe, exactly one year. As I just mentioned in the pre-show there, uh, we were chatting with Yassine here before we went live, and He's like, the last time we spoke on Skype was November 30th. And I was like, that's today. You're like, I know. I know. I it's right now. This. He's like, no, one year ago. Uh, <laughs> so we're excited to have him back on. We're going to talk a bit about Quad Dipsy, which is the race that he just ran. We just talked about Dipsy the other week, and I'm still fascinated by this race. Yassine did it four times. Essentially, uh, the, the Dipsy course four times in the Quad Dipsy stacked field, super fast race, uh, tons of vert. So we'll talk to him about uh, how that race went for him. But also we're going to talk about his new project, Move Through Darkness, which is uh, the same, a similar project to what he did last year. We're going to find out how this year maybe is a bit different, who it benefits, uh, advocacy and all that good stuff. You seem such a great uh, spokesperson for this uh, event and project. So we'll dig into that. Uh, but before we introduce Yassine, of course, we have Kim. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Hi, everyone. Kim Shima Newberry here, as always. If you're joining us for the first time, we are live. Say hello in the chat room. Uh, we'll also be taking questions for Yasin throughout the show. So if you have yes. questions for Yasin, ask them in the chat as well. And before we introduce our guests, we do have some individuals that we like to thank uh, for helping us basically be able to do these live shows every week. We do our daily live show, our reviews, our films, everything. It is the GR crew. It's because of them that we're able to do this full time. Uh, you can join the GR crew. All you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. All tiers have really cool perks and benefits. Uh, three individuals in particular at that top tier. Brian Sands, Rick Bjarnison, and Brendan Quarrel are just, they're wonderful humans, but uh, each individually are ultra runners and, and just talented runners in general and inspiring members of this community who inspire others to get out there and push themselves. Uh, Brian out of Iowa, Rick Bjarnison out of British Columbia, and Brendan Quarrel out of Australia, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, he's training for his first 100 in 2025 at the Yu Yang's Hardcore Race, which is pretty fun. So thank you to those three individuals and to the entire crew. It is because of you that we are able to do this. Uh, without further ado, am I forgetting anything? I feel like I'm forgetting something. I think we're okay. Okay. Yeah, I think okay, we're good. Uh, I just realized I mean, that. I think we're forgetting you seen. Yeah, well, of course, our <laughs> guest. Yes. Uh, it's the end of November. We're getting into December tomorrow, and there are some pretty fun things we're announcing in December. So I'll wait. Yeah. I'll wait till next week's show. Yep. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome back to the show after one year hiatus exactly <laughs> to the day. Our dear friend, Yassine Daboon. Yay! Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on again, my my friends. It's been Man. exactly one year. That one year. No what are the odds of that? We should just make this a permanent thing. So uh, we'll, we'll, be here. Here. we'll be here. We won't leave, but we'll see you in exactly one year. We'll just wait patiently. Well, patiently. I'm, I'm huge fans of you both, as you know. So it's always an honor to be on the show. So thanks for asking me. Uh, of um, course. Vivian in the chat room does confirm. She says, can confirm. It was a year ago, episode 336. So if anyone oh, wants to go back wow. and watch that. Right on. 336. I love, I mean, Vivian is like a resident uh, historian. <laughs> uh, Vivian's amazing. She's, uh, she can pull out, you know, out of her hat. Like I know exactly which episode yeah. number that is and through spreadsheets and stuff. So thank you, Vivian. 336. But you've seen, 
obviously you've been through uh or you've done a lot this year you've you've uh run a ton done some really big projects and stuff like that um how has training been this year compared to last year you know with the swing of things with the pandemic and all that stuff like how have you been able to keep up fitness and 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 all these really cool projects and stuff that you've been working on yeah i you know i always try to stay busy i always have lots on my calendar you know that scares me and that keeps me motivated and keeps me out of trouble so to speak <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, this year uh, was kind of more normal, so to speak, compared mm -hmm. to the prior year. Uh, it seemed like things were starting to come back a little bit more, like, you know, in terms of events and face-to-face -face races and things like that. And uh, I experienced over the last, you know, two years, really, I've experienced, you know, my first time not finishing a 100 miler. Right, which was, which was the first time for me since 2008, I believe, was the first you, year that I have not finished a hundred miler. So that was kind of a a strange feeling for me. Like, was that know, on purpose, or was it sort of circumstance, or you know, like this? I know you to have yeah, completed yeah. some of the most difficult hundred milers on earth, right? Like from hurt to bad water, like all these just crazy, crazy uh, uh, events. So this year, how did that play out? So, well, last year in 2020, I attempted I Am Tough 100 miler in Idaho, which was one of the kind of the only races that was actually happening in person. Right. And unfortunately, I incurred a, a foot ailment or injury during the race and had to bow out of that race. So that was unable to fit it. That was kind of my hundred miler for the year. And then this year I went back to the UTMB race TDS, which is 90 mile race, but it might as well be a hundred miler. I know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those extra 10 I, miles, right? I, I put that in the same category as a hundred miler. And that was a very, just a unfortunate event where a runner just ahead of me had fallen and they had to stop the race for everybody mm -hmm. behind him. So that was kind of a little bit of a, you know, unexpected, um, you know, detour to my, to my calendar, but you know, uh, all in all, I mean, all my problems today are luxury problems. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, I live in an area where I'm able to adventure and, and race and stay motivated and, uh, still get after it regardless of what's going on. So I'm, I'm just grateful for my health and grateful for the community around me and being able to have these opportunities. So it's been good. Yeah. I, you know, I've Already always very wise words. Uh, yeah. The show. And I've always known you to be someone that's been quite busy and creating just wonderful avenues through the sport of running, whether it's for youth and, and the programs that you've created for young runners and kids who are looking to get into the sport or, uh, or, or just your coaching programs and stuff like that. I'm curious you mentioning that this was the first year that you didn't do a hundred mile event. Like, was there, did you feel a, a, a disconnect to the distance or was it just other things that you wanted to sort of focus on? And, and maybe this is the first year in the last 13 that you yeah. thought something different was, was on board. Well, you know, there's always this thought that goes through and you know, you, you can probably relate to this too. It's like when you're doing a hundred mile or you're like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard you say that a lot too. Yes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And I, I've definitely said that like, oh, I'm done with these. these. There's no way <laughs> yeah, these are too long. I'm not. And so, but every year, you know, we keep going back or, you know, you often see that people swear it off and then they sign up for another one, myself included. Yeah. And there is something about that distance that, you know, it's you like, you know, you experience um, intense, agonizing, sometimes struggle and you sure. get through that to the finish line and then you kind of have that as like a fixture on your calendar to work towards. So for me, it's always more about the journey to get to this event. And, and so, like I said, I've had some big events and some big adventures on my calendar that I've been able to work toward like in that same fashion as I would, yeah. even though it wasn't a sanctioned hundred miler. Um, so I, I still feel, you know, connected to that. And uh, I, I didn't feel like, you know, FOMO or anything like that. I just feel like uh, I still, I, I had some big adventures that I did this year. Lowest to highest was was one of them that. Yeah. Um, 
where we did this huge adventure from the lowest point in the lower 48 to the highest point in the lower 48. And so that that was kind of on my calendar as almost like the same as a 100 miler would be, right? And then I mean, TDS happened the way it did with UTMB, you know, which was in some ways a blessing in disguise because I wasn't completely destroyed from TDS going into lowest to highest. Uh, you know, I think this is, this is, I did not know that you had been running a hundred a year since 2008. That's kind of, that's a fantastic yeah. fact. Like what a, what a crazy feat, but knowing your year and lowest to highest is a perfect example. Like I've known you this year to be doing these huge projects. So when you said you didn't run a hundred in my mind, I'm going, that's impossible because everything <laughs> you've seen has done this year is essentially a hundred miler, but uh, it's just a testament to your, your skill and ability, man. The yeah, lowest to highest. Let's let's actually start there because that is something that I wanted to touch on, I guess, briefly before we kind of talk about Dipsy. But the lowest to highest. It sounds like you had quite a hairy adventure out there. You start from <laughs> Death Valley to the top of uh, Whitney, um, a, a, a long journey, a lot of climbing. Uh, what happened as you started getting into the higher altitudes? Because it sounded like this turned into a much longer project than you anticipated. <laughs> Yeah, so just to preface what it is real quick, it's the lowest point in the lower 48 to the highest point in the lower 48. So it's Badwater Basin, minus 280, to Mount Whitney, which is 14.5. And Willie, who is my great business partner and friend, he kind of came up with this idea based on this backpacker who, who made the route, which is the off-road sister to Badwater. Wow. So it uses the least amount of pavement possible. So it's all off road. It's a lot of times there's not, you're not even on trails and it's got a buttload of climbing and, you know, and I'm like, yeah, sure. That sounds like a great sounds idea. Perfect. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Cause you've had such great experiences in death Valley up to this point. Right. <laughs> but it was in mid October and oh, true. it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, in the middle of summer and it wasn't on the road. And, you know, furthermore, we, we pitched the idea to Columbia, which is our main sponsor, to kind of make this documentary about the metaphor of going from low places to high places. Mm. And, and um, something that's very, you know, applicable during this time and, and also just kind of applicable in both of our personal lives of just getting through these like low points in our lives and getting to the high points and you know we're coming up on 10 years being in business together so there was like a lot of stories in there too yeah and so we had a film crew that followed us and we got a lot and so there's a, a documentary coming out in the spring which cool. i'm looking forward to seeing oh, oh i can't wait so what happened was everything was going great and we were a little bit behind schedule and of course you know like all of these adventures and races we do, like the only thing you can really expect is the unexpected, right? Stuff's mm -hmm. gonna happen, you know, that you weren't planning on. And the weather forecast was looking pretty good. We got to approximately mile 85-ish. And I, it was a blue sky. And it was the last time we were gonna see our crew for a while. And I just happened to look off in the horizon and I saw a couple of clouds. And I was like, we should just grab our, our rain gear just in case. And as we kept going, an hour or two passed, it just started getting colder, darker. And next thing you know, we're getting hailed on 40 mile per hour winds as we're climbing. And essentially, we climbed into a blizzard. Oh, God. And we had shorts on. Willie had shorts on, no gloves. I was a little bit more prepared than he was. But uh, essentially, we got up to an 8,000 foot peak. And it was uh, 27 degrees with like high winds. Um, and we were going into a night section on two hours of sleep that was very dangerous and it was very, um, precarious in terms of the footing and especially like coming off of that experience in the Alps where that guy fell, uh, yeah. there was a lot of factors where we were just like, you know, this is not worth it. So we had to kind of reroute and kind of roll with the punches and pivot our, uh, our main line that we were going to take yeah, for safety and kind of make a responsible decision. And, and then it ended up being a great decision because we were able to avoid that section. And then the next day the storm had blown through and we had like a beautiful, like bluebird day summiting Mount Whitney. Wow. And it was just a really special, uh, special experience in many ways. 
I can't wait. And it was wait. very hard. And I realized I, you know, altitude. <laughs> oh my God. Like, oh, I, yeah. I didn't do any altitude acclimation. I'm like, I'll be fine, you know. <laughs> Oh. I'll be fine. I live in Portland. Yeah, I, I live next to the sea. Yeah, I can't wait to go to the highest place. <laughs> well, I was thinking that maybe because we're going like low intensity, so to speak, sure. like, it yeah. wouldn't affect me as much. But we were up over 13,000 feet for quite a while. And just definitely altitude sickness. A bunch of us did, you know, just piercing headaches and nausea, mm. just feeling like garbage. I can't wait to, to see the movie. I mean, just... I'm imagining what's happening and having to make those types of calls on the fly, especially weather related calls and safety type calls like that's a big, you know, especially when you're being followed by a documentary crew or uh, the there is risk there where if you make the wrong call, it's bad. Um, but having to make that sort of transition and, and pivot in real time uh, for a project that you've probably been looking forward to for so long. It's yeah. just a testament to the maturity that you guys have as athletes. Yeah. And you mentioned sort of metaphor. And man, I think this is why I love you as a guest and just as a friend is you have been able to transcend your running to beyond just mileage. Um, rather than looking at it as like, I'm going to go do a 100 mile run or I'm going to go run overnight or I'm going to run up to the highest from the lowest. There's metaphor, there's messaging, there's meaning behind what you're doing in your projects. And we'll talk about Move Through Darkness here uh, in just a second. But this project particularly, yeah. I can't wait to see what you talk about and how you sort of connect from lows to highs and how the how the yeah. having to adapt in real time yeah. is such a parallel to life in general, too. Totally. So. Well, I think, you know, everybody, we all kind of uh are running in, in really kind of processing things and realizing that you know this outlet for us is so much more than just the numbers or just yeah. the you know just the accolades it's a <clears throat> you know it's the self-renewing obsession that we have it's uh therapeutic it's connecting to bigger things it's yeah it's just a vehicle for exploration you know not only physically but self-exploration and uh you know, that's kind of what I'm trying to help, like, young people and people in recovery from substance mm -hmm. addiction try to find this because, like, I never thought that I would like running. I never did. I'm like, yeah, like, that's boring. I don't want to just go run. You know, I, I'll run for soccer or I'll run for basketball or for some of these team sports. But I never realized or thought that I would be so into this sort of activity. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us, especially in the ultra world, yeah. didn't realize that we'd have such a connection. I mean, I, I never considered myself a runner. Running to me was sort of a... Uh, it's like the punishment you get in team sports. Yes. Like, oh, you did this <laughs> right. thing? You yeah. need to do laps totally. until I tell you to stop. Totally. <laughs> that, that's like, it was always a know. punishment, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now, you know, building Ginger Runner, building Why Use Wolfpack, building these brands and businesses and life around a sport, it's it's cool to know that there's more to it than just the mileage. And, and right. I feel like as I get older, I'm finding more meaning behind it. You know, totally. I have to dig deeper for the why and, and it, it means so much more. Yeah, and I think also the last two years have kind of helped most of us find that and feel that even more so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And especially like ultra running, I think, and trail running, we like my dad went with me to Quad Dipsy. It just the the two of us and our little dog went in the camper van, and he was kind of commenting at the race about how many different ages and different body types are in this sport, and it's super inspiring. Like, um, that's what I love about it. That's what I love yeah. about the sport is like, you know, there's all walks of life. There's different ages, there's different body types. And I consistently get my ass kicked by somebody that doesn't <laughs> look like a runner. Okay? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's I, I, I let's dig into Dipsy because I think this is this is going to be a great sort of springboard into the conversation around move through darkness. But Dipsy, uh, we know what Dipsy is, the race itself, because we we just had uh, the winner of this year's Dipsy yeah. on the show a couple of weeks back. But tell us a little bit about Quad Dipsy, um, how it is similar to Dipsy and how it is maybe a, a bit different for our listeners and viewers. Sure. So the Dipsy race is just a point to point from Mill Valley to Stinson Beach. 
It's about seven miles with about 2,000 feet of climbing. It starts off with uh, 623 stairs uh, that start the race. Sounds and easy. Yeah, the little the the <laughs> difference between just the point to point seven mile race is that during that race you can choose different little cut throughs, rather than the quad dipsy you have to stick to the course that's marked. Got it. And so you know the quad dipsy is for the real sickos out there that uh, just so <laughs> seven miles is not enough. You have to go out, back, out, and back, and uh, it's always the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Uh, which in my mind is a great time to go to go run mm -hmm. and to go to go connect with other people too and to also sneak out of Portland. But uh, yeah, the course, other than the cut throughs uh, that you can take during the seven miler, um, it's pretty much the same kind of vibe and same kind of trail. Uh, very difficult, very challenging, uh, beautiful. Um, and it's one of those races where, you know, again, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I, and, I, uh, <laughs> I feel like I've yeah. seen you at enough finish we'll lines. We'll see you here next year. And we'll, we'll see you at Dipsy next year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I've seen you seen at enough finish lines where the That's first words out of his mouth are, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> one week later, I registered. I'm again. doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was thinking about it, too. Like, the quad is very similar to Hurt 100 in a way. Because oh, sure. And that's what I've often used the quad dipsy for a last kind of tune up training race for the Hurt 100. And the Hurt 100 is also an event that I looked at on paper at one point and I was just like, no, I'm never doing that. Like, right. that is ridiculous. That is so not, that does not sound fun. And the dipsy is kind of like that too. <laughs> but, you know, it's a perfect kind of lesson and not judging something until you try it because mm. you know you think that the repetitive nature of you know the hurt 100 five, you know the same 20 mile lap five times or the quad dipsy the same seven miles four times there's actually a lot of benefit to that too there's mm. a lot of things that you don't realize like no it's not going to be mentally tough or monotonous i mean in some ways yes but it, there's also you know the encouragement that you get from the other athletes and runners when you pass them so much and it becomes this almost like this camaraderie that takes place you see them every lap and you know you cheer each other on giving each other high fives and, yeah. and then at the end you're talking about you know your experience and you're having you know food and drinks and you know and the next thing you know you're you're like i'll see you next year and there's people you know that are there, you know, I was running with one guy. It's like, oh, this is my fourth time. This is my, you know, one guy was like, this is my 17th time, you know, like. <laughs> He's 17 years old. It's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, do they still have the, like the age handicaps or like if you're older or younger, any of that sort of stuff? Oh, that's a good question. So that is another difference that they don't, they don't have that for the quad. Everybody Got just st starts together and there's no age graded starts. Yeah. And how many people? Ran it this year. It was like 350 people that started. So a lot of people so still, to be on. Still big that for trail. a trail race. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it just, I don't know. It tickles my like exciting, <laughs> like bone. Like I just really, <laughs> I have an exciting bone. <laughs> and it tickles it. Uh, but the quad dipsy sounds super interesting because it's not like the dipsy is enough, right? You got to do it four times. You got to get yeah. 8,000 feet of bird and like 28 miles or something like that. Yeah, exactly. It, does there come a point in this type of race? Because it's, you know, on paper, similar to Tiger Claw in the sense that it's maximizing vert in mileage. And, and we designed in a relatively short amount of mileage exactly. in the mind of an ultra runner. Right. <laughs> and we purposefully designed it that way, not like Quad Dipsy, but to be a difficult challenge, um, something that anyone can do and approach, but certainly one that will push everyone up to some sort of limiter to line. Did you find yourself a seasoned hundred miler and ultra runner uh, reaching those points in this run where you're like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, this is a, this is harder than I want it to be. And like, what, what is it like for you in always. those moments for something like quad? Always. I mean, almost every race you have those moments, you know, I think I've talked about it on the show before where like the committee, you know, is talking like, oh yeah, you should just drop out at the next spot. You know, uh, they're always talking. Right. But, um, you know, for me, the 
28 miles, I was pushing the intensity a little bit as well, you know, trying to get a certain time and, and things like that. And kind of, it's fun to, to, you know, play with math when you're out there. Cause you, you know, you do the same lap each time. So you can kind of tell like uh, hour and seven this way, <laughs> hour, you know, hour and six, right. minutes, yeah. you know, or, or whatever. And you kind of start playing with how much of a lead you have on the next people behind you or how much, you know, the next person is in front of you and can, how much did I take off on that last lap or how much did I lose uh, right. on that last <laughs> lap? Um, but, uh, you know, and there's always as a runner, uh, I'm sure everybody listening can attest to this, that, you know, there's always that line that you don't want to overstep that threshold of, um, you know, a point of no return, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I feel like that's always the line that you're dancing when you're really competitive and racing. And, sure. uh, you know, I feel like the best races I've had is where I've just been on that edge and I'm just riding that edge without overstepping it too far. And then sometimes you do overstep it a little bit like I did at the Dipsy. But that's part of the fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you, yeah, you got to that point. You stepped a little bit over the edge. Halfway through, three quarters of the way through? Three quarters of the way through, I was having a great run. I was uh, in ninth place at halfway and uh, ninth overall at halfway point. And then three quarters of the way, I had moved into sixth. And I was just like, on my return, I was just like, this is going great. I might even be able to get in the top five. Wow. And uh, I got all the way to this aid station called Cardiac, which is the top. It's literally four miles to go until the finish, and most of it is downhill. And my right hip started tightening up a little bit, and I started dealing with some cramps in my uh, calves. Oh. And Oh, man, it was brutal. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. I only have four miles to go, and it's mostly downhill, and I'm being forced to slow down. And, yeah, it was just uh, one of those disheartening moments where I'm just like, oh, it's just a matter of time before I'm going to get caught. And, you know, then it was just like, pew, 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 you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> Got this, man. Come on. See you at the finish. You know? <laughs> Yeah, like, I know I got it, but my legs don't know. <laughs> yeah, my legs were not on board with that. But uh, it was still so fun. You know, it was a little disappointing that I crumbled in the last forty, uh, last four miles. But uh, made it to the finish. Um, and it's still respectable. And, and even, <laughs> even though I'm kind of hard on myself sometimes, uh, you know, to see my dad there and have him yeah. at the line waiting and just to see everybody, friends and... Uh, encouraging each other again, you know, lots of people that I, that was my third time doing it. So I've gotten to see a lot of the same people there. And so, yeah. And 65 and sunny. I mean, for me, oh. that is like, you know, we'll take it. I don't right. Care if I'm in 40th place, <laughs> give me 65 and sunny, you know? Yeah. The, what um, is this sunny you're what talking is about? Sun yeah. that you're talking about? Uh, I have a vitamin D light on me right now. So. Uh, Yasin's in Portland and we're obviously up in the Northwest too. And yeah. we've been on this terror of like storm after, yeah, storm, storm after storm, after storm, storm. invisible sun. It, it hasn't existed for a while. So I imagine <laughs> that was a nice respite, a nice change of pace. And how cool that your dad got to be there too. And you got to enjoy, yeah. uh, I'm assuming a road trip in the Delica. Yep. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I, I do want to uh, transition a, a little bit into Move Through Darkness because coming off of something like Quad Dipsy that clearly uh, was a tough one, um, you're going into another uh, self project, a project that you created that I think is, it's not easy. Like you're basically running throughout the course of an evening. So for hours and hours and hours, but can you sort of give us the synopsis of what Move Through Darkness is? Because I think our viewers uh, would love to hear about it if they did not. Uh, watch episode 336. So tell us a little bit about this project. Totally. Yeah. So last year, uh, we I started this, or I came up with this idea that basically I would start running at sunset and I wouldn't stop until sunrise at, in the darkest part of the year. Uh, like you said, here in the Pacific Northwest, it's it starting to get dark at 4.30 in the afternoon. doesn't get light out till seven something in the morning, right? 
But, uh, you know, so I'm involved in this organization called the Alano Club of Portland, which provides um, outlets for folks recovering from substance addiction and mental health issues. And so especially last year and this year, it's such an important, um, you know, area that has affected so many people in some way. I'm sure you all probably know somebody or have been affected somehow through your network. And it's really escalated quite a bit in these last two years too that i think not a lot of people have been talking about and we lost one of our guys you know uh last year too to, to suicide and it was just kind of like this emphasis for me to like try to raise more awareness and to also try to fundraise so we can have these programs so the mm -hmm. alano club started with a crossfit gym called uh trg which stands for the recovery gym and that was going great for a while. Like people were getting sober, coming out of treatment, and then they were able to go for free to this CrossFit gym and work out. And, and again, it was just another outlet. It was a connection for them. And after a little while, the executive director, Brent Canode, is a great friend of mine as well. He approached me about starting like a running portion of TRG, which yeah. is the recovery gym. And that's where he approached me about we should start Run TRG, and so Run TRG is the kind of running offshoot of the Recovery Gym. That's what you may have seen, like Run TRG. What is Run TRG? Run the Recovery Gym. Oh wow! And it's the running portion. So what we do is Tuesday night track workouts, and we do Friday night happy hour trail runs, um, and it's grown by leaps and bounds. I mean, we have such a core, like a strong group of folks and these people that get out of treatment or or don't even have to get out of treatment they just basically decide that they're sick and tired of being sick and tired and they want to change their lives and they have this uh they have these outlets that they, they can go to for free mm -hmm. that's provided by the alano club and so um when i came up with this idea i was like how can i use my ultra running you know as a way to you know make uh i'm sorry to uh inspire people to connect people to raise money and awareness about this and that's where i came up with it last year last year you had me on the show and it was really i can't i thank you from the bottom of my heart because you guys helped me so much in terms of getting the word out about it people yeah. ple pledging and so what i did last year and what i'm doing again this year is <clears throat> encouraging people to pledge a dollar per mile and so I'm just going to start my GPS at sunset. And when I stop it at sunrise, whatever that says, that's the dollar amount. So last year I ended up doing 66 miles. And so people, you know, would uh, donate $66. If, but, you know, we, we accept less money too or more, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's going to be similar to what, the same thing we're doing this year as last year. This year we have many more people because our group has grown so much. Uh, that so, was I was going to ask how much yeah. your group has grown since oh. last year's event because it I know is. that it it it's a beautiful project, and again um, uh, you're using running for good and as a metaphor and it's wonderful. So I'm curious how much did it grow? Uh, oh my god! Uh, amongst your community, it is every Tuesday, which I'm actually about to go down there after this call. Uh, every Tuesday, I'm like literally just like, like blown away because it could be pouring rain. We get like 15, 20 people showing up at the track. Wow. I mean, wow. Other people approach me at the track and they're like, what group are you? Like, can we join you? Like, and I'm like, oh, no, it's for, do you, are you addicted to drugs and alcohol? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it's such a heartwarming thing, and it's so rewarding, and it's so great for me uh, to see, you know, these people like hanging out on off hours and doing things together, and like communicating online, and um, you know, doing stuff on the weekends together, and it's creating community, you know, about um, much like our ultra running community. It really, yeah. you know, really is much a lot of the same benefits we get you know, from that, it's just this connection to something bigger, like-minded people. And so, you know, not all people are ready to run 66 miles though. So what we've done this year right. is we've created like a relay 
So now that we have all these people that are runners and they want to be involved, now they're breaking up and organizing and say, okay, I'm going to run this section and tag you, you run the next section and so on and so forth all through the night. And, you know, a lot of us come from a history of staying up all night, you know, in dark places, metaphorically speaking. And so again, this is just another way that is just a symbolism of like, it's going to be a long night. I mean, it's 15 plus hours of darkness from sunset to sunrise. Right. Yeah. It's likely going to be cold and wet, um, but it doesn't hold a candle to the darkness a lot of us have experienced in other places of our lives. And so that, you know, keeping that in mind, keep, keeping in mind the people that are still sick and suffering right now as we speak. And uh, yeah, there's just so many things to draw on. Like we, you know, we get to go do this and we get to last year, we, with the help of you and many other great people, we raised upwards of $15,000. Wow. And so this is like funded a lot of these programs. And like, so these people that are coming to try to change their lives, they can go to these programs for free, have their own coaches, have their own trainers. You know, it's just breaking down a lot of these obstacles and barriers that they might otherwise have. That's, Amazing. Yeah, I didn't really, realize, really cool. man, $15,000 is, is I know. incredible, man. And I, I, I'm so honored to know you, Yasin. Like, oh. I feel like you do such, again, this kind of goes to the power of your projects. You're using your, you're using your ability as an amazing athlete for such good and, yeah. and spreading it too, right? Like helping others find their own meaning in running. And, and this particular project, I'm, anything we can do to help we want to do and i remember that from last year is like when, yeah. we, when we heard about it it was like this is yeah. what a, again a beautiful sort of metaphor working towards sunrise right like working yeah. towards that light yeah. like getting through the darkness to get mm -hmm. to the light and it's brilliant it's brilliant well i respect you guys so much too and you are helping i mean you having me on as a guest and spreading this information to your large network of people is so helpful i mean i can't thank you enough for that so Oh man, no, Great no problem you. whatsoever. Um, yeah, Kim, go for it. Uh, just a comment from Jennifer in the chat room. Jennifer says, "You seen? I super appreciate what you're doing. I'm in recovery myself, and we'll need to hit you up." Uh, and then Michael also says, you got my pledge and appreciation for being such a great member of the PDX running community, you seen. Uh, oh. So if people want to donate or support, is there somewhere they can go do that now? Yeah. Or is this during, like, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Jennifer. Hit me up anytime. And thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, so we have a Move Through Darkness page on our yeastwolfpack.com website. Uh, on the website, there's a section that says Connect. It says Move Through Darkness. On that page, there's a real simple form that you can uh, put your name and email down, and that adds you to the pledge list. And then you don't have to do anything. You just sit back and wait. You don't even have to run. <laughs> no, you don't. In <laughs> fact, you can sit at home and watch me on your screen as I make my way around Portland, Oregon on December 11th. Uh, so, but yeah, that's about it. You get added to the pledge list. And then on Sunday, after I find out how many miles I did, uh, you'll get the email of, and then how to make the, the donation if you want. And then there's another, there's a, also another way you can pledge right now. If you want, you can make a donation of like $25 or or whatever on the on the website as well. Sweet. Yeah, uh, December 11th, uh, for those who didn't catch the date is is going to be this um, it's going to be the move through darkness day. Jean Ives uh, in the chat, Jean Ives uh, mentioned a great question. Sunset to sunrise is the course the same for everyone. So where you are, you seen with the with the crew with the relay and everything like that, will everyone run the same route? Yeah, so I, I made I created a route on Strava which is very similar to the route we used last year. There's a, a few minor alterations, but everybody's going to kind of try to stick to that course. And uh, it's kind of a fun course. It's It starts at the Alato Club of Portland, which is this beautiful mansion that houses all of the meetings and it's the, you know, the offices for the organization. So I felt like it was really symbolic to start there and cool. finish there. Yeah. Yeah. So we start there in the parking lot and it, you know, that's often, you know, this is the parking lot too. When I moved to Portland, I was 
looking for a meeting and I went to that parking lot, you know, and some guy stuck his hand out and said, yeah, welcome, you know, you're in the right place. And so uh, I feel like it's very symbolic to start there. Plus it's very close to Forest Park. So we start by going up the hill into Forest Park, Leif Erikson, which is a fire road that goes out 11 miles that cuts through the park. So that's the first like half marathon of the run is through the forest at wow. night. And then we hit the Wildwood Trail for a few miles. And then we drop down uh, to Savi Island, which is a completely pancake flat, like half marathon loop around this island in North Portland. Cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, and that's a great way for people to like park there and then they can do that loop with us mm. and then come back to their car. And so, yeah, there's uh, and then it just basically comes down on the north side of Portland down to the waterfront and does some a big loop around the uh, river Esplanade. And so we just get a lot of uninterrupted miles circling the bridge, the you know, the river and uh, finishing going back to the track. And then finishing at sunrise at the Alano Club where we started. I, man. Yeah. <laughs> this, I mean, I remember talking to you last year after the project and I feel like it's, it's, it's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really happy for you. And I'm curious, uh, weather played a role last year. I remember it being really wet and cold and that sort of thing. Uh, are you looking forward to that this time, especially coming off of uh, Mount 65 Whitney? 65 and sunny. Well, like yeah, the yeah, storms right. and stuff like that. Yeah. 65 and sunny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the storms that you encountered up on Mount Whitney and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, is your body now acclimated for any storm front that Portland might be able to throw at you? Well, last year, last year we actually got lucky. It was cold, but and it was foggy, which actually it kind of added this. It, ne it didn't rain, though. Good. So we got very lucky. It was just foggy and it gave it kind of gave it this cool, like moody kind of ambiance, but um, never rained. It was just chilly. And I had my camper van and I, you know, stopped a couple of times to make like coffee or, or soup and things like that. But uh, I had it parked in a central location. But um, yeah, definitely worried about this year a little bit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It could be brutal. I mean, it could be, you know, especially with the weather we've been getting to with all the rain. Um, yeah. You know, it could be that could be definitely uh, a lot of changing of jackets and things like that throughout the night. You guys are welcome to come on down if you want to uh, do some miles. And, you know, I realize that, you know, if it doesn't work out this year, uh, next year, there's always next year uh, working together in, in a further capacity, if you like, you know. Yeah. And, and one thing that uh, I wanted to make sure that I asked is, is this something that you plan on expanding beyond the city of Portland? Because it, it seems like it has so much potential to be, you know, every like town for virtual participation. Yeah, for like virtual participation for people um, around the country, around the globe. You know, we obviously have a global audience here, but I can see something like this, the project itself running, uh, moving through darkness catching on in multiple cities and, and totally. being able to, to help multiple organizations. So I'm curious if you have any plans for that sort of thing. I would love to. I, yeah, I would love to. Last year, actually, my buddy Vinny in New York did his own version of Move Through Darkness. And cool. he raised money and like forwarded all the money to us. Greatly appreciated, Vinny. Thank you. And then my friend Kevin did his own version of move through darkness. So I all I agree with you. I think it does have potential to expand to, to other regions. So if you're out there listening and you're not in Portland and you want to participate, set up your own move through darkness and, you know, um, find an organization around you or, you know, you can forward it to us if you want to, you know, uh, we'll take, we'll, we'll make, put it to good use. But um, yeah, I think there is that potential for sure. Uh, it's a fantastic project you've seen and it's for a fantastic cause uh, again we appreciate you just being so open with your journey um, through everything you know not just ultra running but your uh, your past and everything you've been so open on this show and you've talked about so much and we really appreciate it because it has 100% helped many people in this mm -hmm. sport and in the world and and I know that you've often told stories of people who've reached out to you and and found support um, I want to give you, uh, before we wrap up the show here, moving to the after show, I do want to give you the opportunity to, again to mention where people can go to donate or to support uh, the website um, for Move Through Darkness, the project. 
Absolutely. You can go to whyeastwolfpack.com, just W-Y-E-A-S-T, Wolfpack, W-O-L-F-P-A-C-K.com. Uh, you can also find the information on my Instagram, social handles, at Yassine Daboon. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Uh, man, we really appreciate you, Yassine. Yeah. Thank you, you for awesome. just continuing to contribute back to the sport that you love so much. I think it was maybe two <clears throat> weeks ago. I was telling Kim the story. I was trying to relive the story of Keep On Pumping Man, like the <laughs> first time that we'd actually met in person at a race where you <laughs> we were, were just talking about where you ran, but then you were volunteering and like you always Dude. do that. <clears throat> you know, you always give give back yeah it's it's your your one in a million man we really appreciate you oh much appreciated we got to make some t-shirts that say like keep, keep on pumping, pumping man <laughs> i think that was the exact conversation i was having i was like when was that that i said that to you seen or something i just remember or, uh, like yeah, yeah it, it was, was gorge. gorge that's right you were yeah. just like you were so mortified you're like I just yelled, keep on pumping, man, to you seen. Why did I say that? I haven't even met what this guy. What does that guy. mean? I'm just a huge fan of his, and, like, he's going to think I'm an idiot. And I don't even know if you heard me say it in real oh, time. No, I think I had I to did. tell you that. I appreciate it. No, I remember it clear as day, and I appreciated the, the good vibes, you know? <laughs> well, I will always, always remember that story because oh, yeah. – uh, it just it took, gave us a good laugh. Yeah, it gave us a good laugh and stuck out in my brain. Um, thank you so much, Yasin, for joining us tonight. And again, thank you for all that you do Dude, for the running you. community. Man, we Likewise. really appreciate you. Oh, I love uh, seeing you both. You too, man. Same. Our guest tonight has been Yasin Daboon. Uh, you know how to follow him and, and support Move Through Darkness. We're excited about the project and, and how our community can help. Uh, we are going to move into our after show with Yasin. So we'll keep him for five or 10 more minutes. We'll ask any residual questions that popped up in the chat room, that sort of thing. If you would like to join our after show, all you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. All tiers have access to our after shows, both live and archived. Um, but of course, before we do, we have a little segment on our show that we like to call the GR Crew Member of the Week, where we get to recognize members of the community who go above and beyond, do something awesome, push their own limits, and climb the wall and do all that good stuff. <laughs> Kim, who's this week's GR Crew Member? Climb the wall. Good, like, actions there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this week's GR Crew Member of the Week is Meg Chapel, And Meg uh, wrote in our Celebrate Yourself channel, she wrote that she's celebrating that she had run seven times in the past 11 years days maybe this will be the start of something resembling consistency again so congrats meg nice job um, meg. consistency can be a challenging thing and it sounds like you're nailing it well done meg you are our gr crew member of the week and uh can't wait to hear the next update at those seven times in 11 days What's next? Keep us posted. Congratulations, Meg. That's wonderful. That is going to wrap up episode 380 of Ginger Runner Live. Thank you all so much again for tuning in tonight live or listening on the podcast and all that good stuff, which I promised to update. Uh, <laughs> but we appreciate you all so much. We have some fun stuff coming up in December, which is just around the corner. Stay tuned. It's in a couple hours. It's literally in a couple hours. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, it's not around the corner. It's here. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. We'll see you next week. Thanks, all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.